I'm uh, Marjon Jahanshahi. I'm an emeritus professor of uh, clinical psychology and neuropsychology at the UCL Institute of Neurology. I did my PhD on dystonia with the late uh, Professor David Marsden as my supervisor. I first heard the word dystonia or spasmodic torticollis, the group that I, cervical dystonia now, and that I worked uh, with from him. And he said to me, can you go and write a grant proposal um, to look at um, bio, EMG biofeedback treatment um, for cervical dystonia? And as I said, I had never heard either the word torticollis or dystonia or biofeedback. Um, and the deadline for this grant from the Medical Research Council was in two weeks' time. So I had a very busy two weeks finding out all about the treatment as well as the disorder. I wrote a grant proposal and um, we got the, the grant and that became part of my PhD. And as part of my PhD, I also looked at the impact of dystonia as a chronic illness on the daily lives of the patients, how it affected their daily activities, how it affected their mood, um, how uh, it affected employment, um, and try to identify some of the important factors that influenced how people um, either coped well with the chronic illness um, or coped badly with the, trying to identify um, characteristics of uh, good coping and bad coping. I also um, looked at changes in um, the psychosocial impact of the disorder before and after uh, treatment. Um, so uh, I think about three or four years after I started my PhD, botulinum toxin injections became um, <clears throat> a treatment option. And we looked at the impact of having treatment with botulinum toxin and having cervical dystonia much improved as a result of the injections, pain being relieved and the head deviation being improved um, on depression, disability and body image. Um, I was particularly interested in this sense of disfigurement of patients and how that may change as a result of successful treatment. And we found that depression and disability, for example, improved, but the negative body image didn't improve with um, botulinum toxin, suggesting that more needs to be done to get rid of the sense of disfigurement, perceived disfigurement and the body image. And then since then, I've since the PhD, I've done also work on um, the impact of dystonia on um, quality of life uh, in all forms of dystonia. Also looked at the uh, effects of deep brain stimulation um, on patients on cognitive function as well as quality of life as well as mood. Um, and again, deep brain stimulation is a very effective treatment that is um, not only in, improves the symptoms, but also improves mood of the patients. So that's, I think, more or less the types of research that I've done. I've been interested in mainly um, the impact of the disorder as well as the impact of medical treatment of the disorder on the daily lives and the quality of life of the patients. The current work that we're doing on um, dystonia um, with one of my PhD students is to look at the impact um, that a chronic illness like dystonia has on um, subjective well-being and happiness. There is a lot of research now in positive psychology on happiness and what makes people live a happy life uh, or an engaged life. But there is very little work on people who've got chronic disorders. It seems as if happiness is only uh, the preserve of the healthy. So we wanted to change this and look at happiness in people who've got chronic illnesses like uh, dystonia. Um, so uh, Suzette, my PhD student, is actually uh, using questionnaire survey to um, investigate levels of um, subjective well-being and happiness in people with dystonia and comparing it in another chronic disorder, um, Parkinson's disease, and then comparing it to a 
age matched um, healthy people who don't have these chronic disorders. And it would be interesting uh, to see the results. And then on, we hope that on the basis of the results, we will be able to um, develop intervention programs to um, help people with chronic illnesses to lead more happier lives, more engaged lives. And we put together a series of intervention programs um, based on positive psychology that we think could work for chronic illness as well, particularly trying to teach patients to adopt a self-management approach, to become active partners in managing their illness and not allocate, allocating all the responsibility for managing their illness to medical professionals, but also becoming actively involved um, in the management of their um, disorder. As part of these self-management techniques, there are lots of strategies that people can use to live and cope better with their illness. So, for example, one of the important things is being able to maintain a positive self-esteem. With a chronic illness, there's a tendency for people to reduce their identity to that of the illness. So people have to remind themselves that they're not their dystonia, that their identity is wider and more interesting than their dystonia, and to focus on that and try to let all the aspects, the positive aspects, of their identity to shine through, uh, so not letting the illness become their identity. So that's one piece of advice I would give to people. The other one uh, would be that when we think of hardship, there's always someone who's worse off than us. Um, think about all the migrants who are crossing the Mediterranean to um, have a better life. It's important to be able to have to be grateful for all the positive aspects of our lives and we often forget this. When you think about it there are positive aspects uh, to be grateful about in most of our lives. Um, so to be grateful for all the parts of your body that are working, to be grateful for all your friends and family, to be grateful for all the things that you can do. Every day may not be good, but there's some good in every day if you think about it. And I think a good strategy um, would be at the end of every day to think of, uh, to have a sort of a gratitude check, to, to think to yourself, what were the most um, important things that I'm grateful for um, in my day to day uh, before you go to sleep. So that would, the gratitude check is in a, in a sense another strategy. The other thing is research suggests that social support um, is important. Social support is having people in your life, family, friends, colleagues, to whom you can um, turn to for advice, for understanding, for sympathy, for emotional ventilation. Um, and there's evidence suggesting that um, social support can pr have a protective effect for chronic illness, the stresses of chronic illness. Um, and it's important to not let um, embarrassment interfere with your social support network. It's important to um, establish and look after your social support network because that's very helpful living with a chronic illness. Um, and then finally, I think looking at chronic illness, managing a chronic illness can be time consuming. And people often forget about the leisure activities, the fun parts of life. So it's important not to um, forget about those and to make time for those. So making time to, for listening to music, for reading books, getting together with friends, seeing films. We all need a break. Um, and that allows you to refresh and be ready for the next challenge.